Thank you, Ambassador Chen, again for the inspiring, insightful uh, review. And uh, so th this, uh, uh, very, she gave us a very uh, uh, a comprehensive review of the history and the current situation and the future. And it's very natural now to come to the, the panelists and to have uh, detailed discussions. We have a very excellent uh, uh, group of people. I have not waste my time to reintroduce them again. Uh, Professor Ma has made a good introduction. But they are from very different perspectives. We have people from Hong Kong, the United States, academic, government, politician, business association. We would really like to see their views. And here I'm going to organize then the discussion like the following. I would I propose a number of questions and then they can discuss them and or add their relevant issues to discuss. And then we uh, uh, maybe uh, Ambassador Chen would add uh, subs, uh, uh, at, the, at the end. Uh, you, you will take a rest first. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we, we open up and to the floor for a number of uh, questions and comments. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> I remember 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, Paul Cookman then the professor at Stanford University, and in late uh, in 2008, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. He visited Hong Kong. He gave a speech in the in the center, and uh, he was invited by Hong Kong UST. Professor Kiji Chen was a host of his visit, and I forgot almost everything he said in the speech except one. Well, it's amazing if uh, if you give a speech. 20 years later, people still remember. I am sure at Benson and Chen's uh, talk, we still remember 20 years later. Okay. So this is what uh, Paul Cookman said. He said, in the next century, so he was talking the, uh, in the, at the end of last century, he said, in the next century, one of the biggest challenges in the, in the world will be China-US relationship and the, uh, the conflicts. And I think most people didn't, uh, can, can, could not foresee about this because at that time, as Ambassador Chen reviewed, and China and the United States had a very good relationship. China was very eager to learn and, and, and from the U.S., and U.S. didn't see China as a threat. Okay? But this is what his reasoning. <coughs> he said, well, in the next century, China and the United States will be the biggest superpower economically. They are very equal in terms of economic power. However, the two countries remain in dif difference in many, many dimensions. Political system, democracy, cultural value, per capita income. These are the differences remain. And that will inevitably lead to conflicts. And here they are. He didn't expect uh, Donald Trump would be the president of the United States, but somebody, David Trump, maybe Michael Trump, Will be and so it's, it cannot be a war. So let me turn to the speakers. My questions would be: What caused the current uh, political economic conflict between the U.S. and China, and how serious this is? This is how damaging it is, and how it's going to evolve in the future, and what we should prepare and what we should do. Uh, these are the questions I have in my mind, and I hope you can share with us your wisdom and perspectives. Can I start with uh, Professor Ch Casey Chen? Well, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Hello? Yeah. Thank you, Larry. You mentioned the uh, Paul Krugman lecture, and I remember when I invited Paul Krugman, it was uh, uh, out of the, uh, the, uh, the, the money donated by Citibank, headed by uh, Liang Gang Chong. That was the, the time when I invited uh, uh, Larry. Um, Henry, sorry. Now, um, I thought after uh, Ambassador Professor Chen's uh, excellent speech, I really have nothing to add, okay? <laughs> because he's one of the most inspirational and eloquent, uh, eloquent uh, summary and discussion of what's, what really happened. Um, I thought what I would do, uh, based on your questions, uh, uh, Professor Larry Chiu, the, I would just uh, uh, perhaps highlight some of the more immediate aspect uh, and try to really bring a few points for, for, for discussion. Uh, I think most of the last six months uh, in, in Asia, in Hong Kong, uh, I, think, I think we are all asking this question. 
what is going on here? Is this a trade war? What kind of trade war? Or are we in a cold war? I mean, this is kind of the questions that, that we've been asking. Uh, of course, there's, there's so little to really go, go on because there's so little historical precedence, uh, uh, like the nature of the US and China conflict that people really have, can go by. So it's a lot of uh, kind of nervousness and discussion. And I would say, if I, if I would try to really um, discuss what is happening now and, and maybe how can we what, we, what may be happening and how can we see maybe some kind of uh, light out of tunnel, uh, at the end of the tunnel. I think the question now is uh, who are the players? You know, who are the players? A lot of going on, besides the geopolitics, there's still personality, the players matter. Um, without, without Trump in the White House, we won't get to where we are. And of course, uh, most of the people in Asia are, con are quite confused as to who is really um, ha having a say in the US policy, other than Trump, of course. Uh, who else have, a, have had a policy? There is, of course, Trump, Donald Trump fixation about deficit. That, that, that mercantilist uh, understanding uh, by Donald Trump is, uh, I think, is very uh, unique. Uh, most people these days don't think about trade in terms of deficit, but Donald Trump clearly, dating back from his uh, 1988 uh, younger man's view, he always thought that, you know, if I, if I have deficit with you, then, 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 uh, then I'm losing to you. That, that's really a very strong uh, fixation on deficit. Of course, there is other uh, geopolitical uh, views. I would loosely call them the, uh, the, the, the China hawk uh, who are in the White House, uh, who is also using Trump presidency uh, to uh, advance their, their views and their, uh, their policy goals vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So that's a mixture of, uh, of players in, in, uh, in the White House, which is why I thought initially when, when the, uh, the tariff measure were, were announced, uh, there, there is a amount, quite great deal amount of confusion uh, in the market as well as uh, you know, various places as to exactly what is it that the U.S. wanted. Uh, the, there is a question uh, in Asia as to is it, the, is it the China really misjudge the situation? Did China understand that this is more about deficit, this is really more about the, the bilateral relationship uh, over you know, many dimensions, uh, even a strategic rivalry, uh, more than just uh, deficit. Uh, my, my own reading uh, is that China actually, uh, uh, I don't think China really make, make a misjudgment. I think China understood that this is, uh, this is more than trade. Uh, the, the, you know, and China really have been managing this very carefully. They didn't want this to be getting out of hand, getting, getting beyond trade arena into something more difficult to handle politically as well as, uh, uh, you know, psychologically. Um, and the question, of course, is difficult for China, for China to, uh, in my opinion, to really respond to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the White House demands because it seems that the original list of demands that we actually, re you know, heard, heard from various uh, sources of reporting uh, contained a very long list of U.S. demands, and some are very difficult to, it seems, difficult, difficult for U.S. Uh, for China to agree to, uh, such as uh, you know giving up the uh, state, the state subsidy for uh, for uh, technology investment and so on. So, so long list of China, uh, U.S. demands were very hard to meet. Um, I think that's why we saw the last few months a, a, a standoff, an escalation on both sides, and a standoff. Uh, because uh, there is no script, there's no easy playbook you can go by as to how to begin a negotiation when you do not know who are the dominant uh, players in the White House at the end of the day and who will actually, which will we actually win now. Um, now, question is, are we there yet? Now, given the, 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 uh, the, the seems to be the warming up, little warming up of, the, of, the, of, a, of a tone in the White House, and the, uh, the meeting uh, in the G20 meeting between President Xi and, and, and President Trump, uh, is this something is going to happen or not this time? Uh, it's very difficult for me, to, of course, to speculate. Um, but I think there, if, if, we, if we actually look at the, the fundamental conflict, as, uh, as outlined by uh, uh, Ambassador Professor Chen, 
Uh, of course, this is more than trade. This is really a long-term strategic rivalry between the two. Uh, and there is no way, uh, I believe, U.S. will accept a, a, uh, a rise uh, in, uh, in Chinese uh, uh, position uh, to challenge U.S. You know, having, I haven't lived in U.S. for a long time. I, I can understand the attitude from U.S. Uh, so, so your, dis your depiction about multipolar with, with one, big, one, one big pole, that's really clearly uh, uh, is the situation. Um, but I think even having said that, uh, I think China and U.S. must realize that tariff itself is really not serving anyone's purpose. Tariff is a, it's a blunt uh, instrument. Uh, you can get the attention of the, uh, of, of the other player. But it doesn't solve your problem. So, and I believe that you know the tariff. If you keep on escalating the tariff to, to a, you know to 25 percent of covering all the exports, uh, that will actually do tremendous damage uh, to to both sides. Uh, so, so a, a realistic way is must be found so that there is a negotiation. Uh, there is a way to, if not uh, totally uh, take away the tariff, but call a stop call it choose on a tariff and, ne and negotiating something real that actually, uh, that actually uh, uh, can, can really lead us our t to a conclusion. Now, I think, I think that, is it, is, it, is, it, is it the right time that will happen? I don't know. Uh, uh, but I think, that the, the, I think that given the, the way the tariff is happening, is there, the, I think I'm, I'm more optimistic that at some point in time, there will be some negotiation, real negotiation. Uh, now, of course, a real negotiation will have to include some of the issues that are very difficult to negotiate on, such as the so-called forced transfer of technology, uh, such as the market access. Uh, so whether or not China and U.S. can actually come to, come, come to some kind of agreement on that uh, is a good question. And even if you begin negotiation on those points, it will take a quite a long time. So that's, that's, hard, that's the hard part. And I, I would like to think that, uh, that, that Trump, Donald Trump would like to see some way out of this. He, uh, not because necessarily for the midterm, but a sort of midterm election may have raised marginally the probability that Trump want to see an outcome, a negotiated outcome. Uh, but I think Donald Trump also want to win. He, he'd like to win a deal. So, so, so his, his propensity of, of trying to really get out of this and getting a deal is quite high. In fact, there are, there are some people, both in the U.S. and other areas, are so worried that tr Donald Trump will just accept an agreement because Donald Trump is really more about transactions than, for example, not having a very strong position about the technology transfer and market access, that kind of things. So I think that's a, people also worry that Trump may agree to a deal very quickly, uh, so that's so. So I'm not so sure. You know, that's, you should be worried about that. But uh, may, maybe there's a time uh, the two sides would could talk. But even a talk like that would be uh, would, would not be easily come to uh, come to conclusion. Uh, I think that with the, the, the very quick quick way I would put it is that the long term uh, strategic rivalry uh, between China and 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 U.S. is real. The new economic order is happening. Uh, we are not going to go back to before, you know, before all this happened. So, so the question is whether we can actually see at least the short-term damage of this uh, to be minimized and uh, having some kind of uh, discussion. Thank you, Professor Casey Chen. And, and Professor Casey Chen, uh, view this is as a game between the two countries. And the only way out is to, through negotiation. But it will take a long time, it's difficult. It's a long battle. So, and it's very interesting. Um, we want to see more American perspective, and uh, fortunately, we have Miss uh, Miss uh, Joseph uh, to give us a view on from the U.S. perspective. Perhaps I feel like I'm in. Hello. Yeah. Testing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in the hot seat today. I have to tell you, <laughs> sitting up here. But it's wonderful to come on stage because I'm looking out at an audience that is filled with people from, say, the class of 1973 from Hong Kong University mm -hmm. who've grown up and had their careers in what was seen as an established world order. Also out here in the audience, we have students 
maybe not even in university yet, right. who are wondering this upheaval that we're experiencing. What does it mean for me, my future, and where I live? These are really troubling and changing times that we're living in. The one thing that I am certain about is it is troubling and changing times that we will all have to negotiate and all have to think through beyond just watching what our government leaders are saying and doing. I really appreciated the lecture we had earlier from Professor Chen. I think there are three main reasons why we find ourselves here today. The first is, on the part of the United States, really potentially a miscalculation of the meteoric rise that China would make in such a short period of time. I think many of us are aware, as we start to look at the 40 years of China opening up, how far it's come and the amazing developments that we've seen. But the actual impact of China's opening up, the actual impact of China's globalization and its global leap forward, has really rustled the world trade system. It's really added a lot to countries to try to understand how to deal with this. No one more than the United States. And I remember when I was a journalist and I'd ask people about why is China coming out so quickly and how will it continue to grow? And many people in the democracy of the United States would say, well, China's developing very rapidly. However, it doesn't have the innovative culture that the United States has. So the US has an edge in that front. Witness WeChat. Tencent, all the China technology companies that have developed very rapidly, have IPO'd in the United States, and the wealth that China has accumulated over the last few years. That has really stunned a lot of people who actually maybe weren't even watching or looking at how that was going to impact in the world. On many other people seeing tourists suddenly coming out, the changes that we were seeing in American universities, the engineering students from China, who took up large spots uh, in American universities, coupled with the US increasingly worried about its own background and people who were not benefiting from globalization worrying and realizing that the situation around them was changing. There's a second issue that I think is really important to understand where we are today and maybe something that we have a misconception of. And I would call that technical disruption. The disruption of the internet has really changed the way we view the world. The way communications happen have really changed massively over the last few years. So while diplomats used to meet behind closed doors, while economic strategy was planned behind closed doors, and there may be a report or a communique coming out 24 hours, 48 hours later, now things are tweeted, Facebooked, moved, opinion is put on the internet, uh, there's fake news out there. It has really changed the dynamics and understanding of the way we communicate. We have a president that tweets. It's entertaining, and like it or not, it does affect the way we view the world, whether we're sitting here in Hong Kong or whether people are frustrated by what they're hearing or really listening to what President Trump has said. The internet has also changed the economy in a massive, massive way. So new economy companies in the United States, that's where the real economic growth is coming from. And if you aren't part of that new economy or aren't educated in that new economy, well, there's a whole group of people who have been sidelined and really feel sidelined by the notion of globalization. That has changed the viewpoint in the United States. Meanwhile, the internet has blossomed in China. There's a whole new method of communication, WeChat, a whole new ecosystem of companies that have come up. And I think that has really had an impact on the way the world is changing. Last but not least, I think people tend to pin it on President Trump, like him or loathe him, as a strong leader who has made a case for where the United States is now, and for really saying it's time to level the playing field with China. But we have two strong leaders coming from very different systems. The system, the one-party system of China, with President Xi, who has made it clear that China has global ambitions and is growing rapidly, 
and a president who's looking at an electorate, many of whom who have not benefited from globalization, who are truly concerned about how the United States is positioning itself. I would disagree with the notion that the U.S. is in retreat. I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, the companies that I represent who are based here in Hong Kong with uh, many corporate headquarters for Asia based here, these are people who would like to be doing trade in Asia. In fact, the number of U.S. companies coming to Hong Kong has continued to increase in the past year. And if we look at the engagement with Southeast Asia in particular, or the number of trips that the Trump administration has made to Asia, this is not a country in a retreat. This is a country that's trying to redefine where it fits in in the world and also recognizes that the multilateral system that people had come to depend on doesn't necessarily work anymore. One last misnomer that I think is really important to understand from over here. Again, I'm not a particular supporter of President Trump myself, but many people say we pin it on President Trump. This is a man who wants to uh, give it to China or have a very hard relationship with China. Actually, in Washington today, the view of a level playing field, of a need for reciprocity, of national security uh, concerns around the U.S. and China relationship can be seen what we call across the aisle. That is from Democratic representatives and senators to the National Security Council to the Republican and more conservative politicians on Capitol Hill. There is a wide-ranging view and concern over where this relationship is going. That might be difficult to stomach, but I think it's also important that people realize that there needs to be a realignment. And whether we like it or not, I think this is something we're stuck with for a long time until there is a new understanding and a new balance. Thank you, Mrs. Joseph. And uh, she told us that uh, the a number of issues and misunderstanding of miscalculation of China's rise and, and misconception about the tech, new technology, the impact. And also we should understand uh, pre pre President Donald Trump's. So let me turn to uh, the Honorable Lam. And, and as uh, Professor Ma mentioned, I, I thought you would talk something on politics, but, uh, uh, but you may even talk about the industries, right? Sure. Okay, please. Well, um First of all, I'd like to see if there is any CNN reporter here. <laughs> I want to make sure that I do not have to face um, questions from them. They haven't uh, been banned yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I'd like to uh, thank Ambassador Chen for the very inspiring speech. Uh, by listening to your speech, I think we gained 10,000 years of studying. Sing Dok Man Shu. Um, I don't have a Scottish uh, lecture named after me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what, what was interesting about this so-called trade war, it, it's not really a trade war. You know, this trade war between China and United States has evolved into a political dispute. So, why? You know, th th there are many, many reasons. But let me narrow down to two. Um, uh, I think the, 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 the first one is the competition. The competition, economic competition and technological comp competition. Who can dominate these two areas, uh, these areas? Thank you, Professor, Ch uh, uh, Professor Ma. I was putting my microphone too far away. Um, and uh, the economic and uh, techno uh, technological dominance is, is important to the two countries. I think speakers has mentioned China has uh, risen very rapidly in the last uh, 20, 30 years in areas of economics and areas of uh, technology. Uh, I, I think in the U.S. or U.S. company are still miles ahead of the Chinese company in terms of uh, development. Uh, but how long will it take for the Chinese company to catch up with the U.S. companies. I think at least 10 years, maybe longer. Um, and, and also the second reason 
I, I think it's because of the rise in populists. Isolationist and also the uh, protectionist um, sentiments in the world, especially in the US, it's, it's everywhere. And what Trump has emphasized, make America great again. You, you know, it's now in everybody's mind. But at whose expense? China's expense. But we can't change it. Any American who is patriotic would not say anything against it because who doesn't want to make America great again? Any Chinese would say the same thing, make China great again, you know. That would be something right and patriotic. But now the world um, economic scene and also the political scene has changed. Uh, China had supported, a call, uh, uh, as said by Ambassador Chen, into WTO, and China has gained uh, in different ways by being a member. Look at the growth um, in China in the past 20 years. Of course, you know, this is the 40 years that we have uh, entered into the uh, reform, but it's the last 20 years that China has changed very, very much. Uh, I think a lot of people are worried, uh, and they, th there are reasons for them to worry. Uh, back to today's topic, um, the trade war, how Hong Kong will be affected. Even Hong Kong is a separate economic region, but because of our close relationship with the mainland, um, as what was suggested by the report in Congress last week, uh, some even suggested uh, maybe putting the two regions together. I think that's adding um, fuel to the fire. You know, I think every one of us knows that two separate economic regions is under the regulations of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. So anybody with any common sense would not suggest that. But in the political world, it's different. They can say anything. The president can say anything, our ministers can say anything, I can say anything I want. Uh, by making ourselves popular, I mentioned about populists and anything that's a, that they can gain. Um, what can we do by protecting ourselves? U.S. buyers nowadays are very different from uh, the old days. A lot of the buyers in old days, or, or a lot of the companies in old days, are run by families. There are a lot of special and close relationships. But now all the companies, most of the companies, are run by professionals. Professionals will put pressure on the um, uh, factories and they want to drive their profit up to them. By driving the profit up, they will gain bonus. That's all they want, profits, profits, and profits. So under this trade war situation, uh, they have asked uh, Hong Kong companies, because many Hong Kong companies have uh, base in, in the mainland, and some has already suffer the 25% duty. Some are not yet. I hope not. Uh, but if uh, President Trump decides to put everything under this 25% tariff situation, then every company will be affected. So they have asked the, the companies to move the production lines to, uh, Ambassador Chen has mentioned, Vietnam and the ASEAN countries. Can they easily do that? No. The margin in recent years has been very, very thin. So why, why do it? Spend millions of dollars moving the production line to the ASEAN countries and not sure about the certainty of orders that can make money. You know, the only thing that is certain nowadays is uncertainty. So by investing millions and millions of dollars and not knowing when to get the returns, I won't do it. Will you do it? 
So another way to pressure the companies is to, well, we share the duty if it comes in. 12.5, 12.5. Do we have the margin? We do not have the margin. And then they would shop around for the, lo the lowest vendor. So it's becoming very, very tough. But, but as Ambassador Chen said, not everything could be moved. First of all, there are not enough capacity anywhere. And also the know-how, the professionals that has been doing all this manufacturing uh, in a long time cannot be shifted. Maybe this trade war is happening during a good time, when everything is still around, when all the technology and all the production has not been shifted outside the mainland. So it's time for us to do what we have to do, what we need to do. Uh, maybe turn our head north, north of Hong Kong. The domestic market is so, so big. We have, it's, it's more than four times of the United States, but the United States is still the biggest market. I'm not asking anybody not to ship to the United States. It's still a very important market. We need that market. But we should also look into the, 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 the Chinese market as well as the ASEAN and other worldwide markets by diversifying. Well, the world has changed. Um, but how can we put everything back to order? Okay, trade order, political, you have your say, we have our say. I, I don't think we can always have one line, one word that we can agree on. Like yesterday, no agreement for the first time in the, uh, in the meeting. Um, but I think we have to, um, uh, like a Chinese saying, um, we have to uh, believe and trust each other. Without any trust, the world can not continue this way. Uh, so uh, I would stop here, and uh, I, I, I welcome any, any, any questions. So the, the key words from uh, Mr. Lam is the competition protectionist, and the profit is very small, and the damage is very, very large, right? So, and we should avoid this. And Tara, you want to add something? Well, I, I wanted to, to add to this part about profits and the, the drive for profits and also your question about what can we do about it um, beyond watching politicians uh, with big personalities uh, derive what the new world is going to be. I think there are areas where as individuals we can take responsibility, which is consumerism rampant consumerism has been another driver of where we are today. And as individuals, if we understand that we don't need to consume so many cheap products, that we don't need that extra everything, we can actually rebuild the world in, in a much more sensible model. And I also agree with this drive for profits, with understanding the responsibilities that companies have to society and the world order beyond simply pushing it for the best profit possible for the shareholders. So I think as individuals, we have a responsibility to understand that and the role we play in what has become a rampant consumer economy. That's a very good suggestion.